I just had to share this video with you. I still can't bring myself to get through 1984. I like got to the first chapter, but I've heard so many things about it, studied it for so long, seen bits and pieces of the movie, and listened to so many like little crash courses or thug notes or whatever that um that has given me a good base of understanding for this horrific <laughs> fucking movie. It's so hard to watch. It really is. And I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky, upbeat kind of a person. You know, just as a saying, I don't believe in luck with the Eastern thing, but this this saying of it, jovial, I guess is a good a good word. But um, it, that's a hard book to take in, right? So I really, really, really like when people do these tiny little things on drawing parallels and lessons and understanding of a, of a, a framework of how society is being warped and changed to bring about the rise of what the prophet Daniel and the prophet Jesus, who is God, and um, John and uh, the prophet Paul and so many of our Jewish heroes of the faith um, that we would see in global government coming about. So it's really interesting to get into this dude's mind because this guy just... Were there ever a dude that had the wiring to know how to create, essentially, a how to enslave humanity <laughs> type of experience? It was found in this dude's mind. I just would have loved to have had coffee with him one day and just talk to him and just get a taste of his personality. Anyhow, How Freedom Dies, George Orwell in 1984. And I, yes, I had to read it backwards because you know that from their insignia of Insoc or whatever it's called, uh, in, Insoc, I guess is how it's pronounced. It, just even the wording of it, it seems to be backwards and they've done that on purpose. So let's listen. <laughs> George Orwell's writings have experienced a spike in popularity over the past decade and for a simple reason. Modern societies are becoming ever more like the dystopia depicted in Orwell's most famous book, 1984. Whether it be mass surveillance, the incessant use of propaganda, perpetual war, or the cult of personality surrounding political leaders, it is not surprising that many see Orwell's novel as prescient in many ways. With that said, the West remains much freer than the dystopian society of 1984, but the trend does not bode well for those who favor a free society. Orwell, in fact, believed that totalitarianism of the type he satirized in his novel was a distinct possibility for the West, and at times he went as far as to suggest that it may in fact be inevitable. Almost certainly, he wrote in 1940, we are moving into an age of totalitarian dictatorships. In this video, we will look at what caused Orwell's pessimism, focusing on two trends in particular the move toward collectivism, and the rise of hedonism. Oh, wow. Collectivism is a doctrine, or set of ideologies, in which the goals of a certain collective, such as a state, a nation, or a society, are given precedence over the goals of individuals. Socialism, communism, nationalism, and fascism are all collectivist ideologies. Orwell believed that a precondition for the rise of totalitarianism was the emergence of a collectivist social structure, as this permits the centralization of power needed to exert total societal control. Orwell's view of the connection between totalitarianism and collectivism has proved puzzling, as Orwell was a staunch leftist, a critic of capitalism, and a socialist. How could someone who favored socialism, a collectivist ideology, at the same time write a dystopian novel which portrays a collectivist society in such a horrific manner? To understand his position, it must first be realized that Orwell did not consider capitalism to be a viable system. It is not certain that socialism is in all ways superior to capitalism, he wrote, but it is certain that, unlike capitalism, it can solve the problems of production and consumption. Capitalism was such an inadequate system in Orwell's mind that, like many leftists of his day, he believed that it was on its deathbed and would soon be replaced by some form of collectivism. He saw this as inevitable. The issue for Orwell was what type of collectivism would take its place. The real question, he wrote, is whether capitalism, now obviously doomed, is to give way to oligarchy, totalitarianism, or to true democracy, democratic socialism. 
Following the impending death of capitalism, Orwell hoped that democratic socialism would be adopted in the West. Democratic socialists, like Orwell, advocated for a centrally planned economy, nationalization of all major industry, and a radical decrease in wealth inequality. They were also strong supporters of civil liberties such as freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, which they hoped could be maintained in a society which would largely deprive people of their economic freedoms. The problem, however, which Orwell and other socialists had to grapple with were the lack of examples, either past or present, of any countries successfully adopting democratic socialism. <laughs> Even worse, the states that had turned to collectivism in the first half of the 20th century, such as Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, were becoming increasingly totalitarian. They were adopting what Orwell called oligarchical collectivism, not democratic socialism. Oligarchical collectivism is a system in which an elite few, under the guise of a certain collectivist ideology, centralize power using force and deception. Once in power, these oligarchs crush not only the economic freedoms of their citizens, a move which socialists like Orwell favored, but also their civil liberties. Orwell was concerned that following the death of capitalism, the entire Western world would perhaps succumb to oligarchical collectivism. This fear was in part due to his perception that hedonism was on the rise in Western societies. Hedonism is an ethical position that maintains that life's ultimate goal should be the maximization of pleasure and the minimization of pain and discomfort. In an increasingly urban and consumerist West, Orwell believed that many people were structuring their lives in a hedonistic manner, and this did not bode well for the freedom of Western civilization. A hedonistic lifestyle, according to Orwell, weakens people. It makes them feeble and incapable of mounting any resistance to fanatical ideologues who desire to rule over society. This fear of Orwell's has proven unfounded up to this point. While the West, since his death in 1950, has in many respects become more hedonistic, this has not led to totalitarian dictators taking over control. Rather, Adolf Huxley, the author of another famous 20th century dystopian novel, Brave New World, may have had a better grasp of the way Western societies would become enslaved in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Huxley, like Orwell, was an anti-hedonist, but his aversion to hedonism differed from Orwell's. Huxley's main concern was that hedonism could be used as an effective tool to oppress a society, because people will willingly forego freedom in exchange for sensory pleasure and endless consumption. If a society can be structured so that people can devote much of their time to pursuing pleasures, gratifying material wants, and even drugging themselves to escape from reality, then persuasion and conditioning, rather than physical coercion, will be sufficient to exert extreme control over a society. Neil Postman, in his book Amusing Ourselves to Death, nicely contrasts the differing fears of Orwell and Huxley. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture. In 1984, people are controlled by inflicting pain. In Brave New World, they are controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that what we fear will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we desire will ruin us. Wow. The West, it seems, finds itself in a situation somewhat analogous to what Huxley feared. For like the proverbial frog in boiling water, oh. citizens in the West accept greater and greater intrusions into their freedoms and with little resistance. The overt physical coercion that Orwell <laughs> thought would be required to enslave a society has so far proved unnecessary. Before dismissing Orwell's fears completely, however, it must be noted that Orwell was familiar with Huxley's position, and he did not deny that the hedonistic society Huxley feared was a possibility. But he saw it as a temporary stage, creating the ideal conditions for a more brutal regime to seize control and impose its will on society. Whether Orwell will be proven correct in the end remains to be seen. Yet as was pointed out, Orwell did not believe the totalitarianism which he feared could emerge in a society without at first becoming collectivist. So perhaps what has prevented his fears from coming true thus far is that capitalism did not die as he believed it would, and collectivism has yet to emerge fully formed in the West.
Or has it? And it's just kind of starting to trickle down, trickle down, trickle down. He had a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, Frog in boiling water. Look at that. That this is um this is very interesting, this picture. So when you see all of these bald headed people, you you know, obviously this is a woman, but ideally when you plug in the Kabbalah that we talk a lot about uh, from a research standpoint and then pouring everything through a biblical worldview. It's really interesting because when you go over to trans apocalypse now, his channel, I really like his channel. He will delve into the meaty Masonic Kabbalah underpinning underpinnings of the religion of like Anana worship, Ishtar worship, or these various um, death cults from the ancient uh, far East who they would worship this he, she entity and they, their behavior would match with their God. Right. So in the Bible where you have conversation about, you know, an entity being like its father, it's kind of along that core same set of principles that as the father is so that shall the son be. And you can see that with Jesus Christ and his father, right? They're always Lock and step, lock and step, lock and step with everything, right? Always good, 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 right, 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 correct, 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 right? All that. And ideally, society will be rescued by that, by that principle carried forward when Jesus then has many brothers, like it says in Hebrews, and he um, gave himself to create this one new humanity. But in opposition to that, and that is the good news, that is the victory, we're not waiting to see if God will win. We're waiting for God to win, Okay. But in opposition to that, these Kabbalists have this belief system that you need to combine everything back into one, including make God and mankind into one, to make the male and the female into one. So right now you have this whole society of collectivism, you know, telling us what to think, how to think and whatnot. And when you consider the principles of, of the, the sexual perversions being placed out in society. And so, for example, you have Miley Cyrus and she's all of a sudden now popping off with, I'm pansexual. I have sex with everything, blah, 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 which is what pan means. It means all. And pan is a God who was like, whoa, into major debauchery and just kind of like sin gone to pot, like no stopping, no standard, no you know, you just go for it, whatever you want. Because remember, these people believe that they're gods. And therefore, when you're your own God, you're in control of everything. And Satan will continue to tempt you to the uttermost of the worst of the worst of the worst. And you kind of see that in Aleister Crowley, who died green, likely demon possessed. I mean, it'd be pretty hard to convince me that dude wasn't demon possessed. And yet you have all these celebrities, all these people that are building this platform of this collectivism within this religious ideology of Masons who want to follow in his same footsteps. And yet he died green and gross and nasty. And now he's in hell burning for his sins. But you have all these celebrities, all these people in government, all this global government governance, all this religious underpinning of this entire group of people who want to take you to how they want to sculpt society. And it, it's, it's the same thing as what these ancient people used to worship for their Greek gods that really were demons behind the idols. And these gods behave badly. They weren't holy. They weren't good. They were bad. So this whole idea that they are going to continue pushing, you know, you're supposed to let your kid decide if that's a boy or a girl kind of a thing. That is an example of, of what I'm talking about. But it's really to get us to this end goal of this divine androgyne, this, this thing that stands up in the face of God and says, I will not be what you've made me to be. And I will mutilate my body to, to, and cut off my nose to spite my face, that saying, so that I can have my own way. And so you have this influx of celebrities, whether they keep it quiet or whether they're vocal about it. And you have both. And you have this gender transitioning movement and then that leaks out into the public and it's all about this control structure from within that tells you how you're supposed to do things and it's always anti-biblical anti-biblical worldview anti going underneath the submission of jesus and they paint that to be the worst possible picture ever that is how society is going to be turned to full bore satanism 
and then you know eventually this noahide coming and then killing people when they don't do as this one group of totalitarian crazies in power and control set everything up to be because satan's end goal is to kill it's it's to change society and then kill it off really at its deepest chorus end point that's the goal i would say also that when you see this big brother is watching you and then you have all these celebrities that are doing all these hand signs and things like that and masonry they're all telling you the same thing it is good and efficacious to know what these signs mean because they're telling you in a thousand different ways that you are under heavy surveillance you are